Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the TechSRS Community of Practice ECHO. Please note that we are recording these sessions for future distribution. Anything listed in the chat does not appear in the recording. Uh, you may uh, change your name to your first name only if you would so prefer. My name is Shreya Prasanna and I will be the facilitator for today's session. A few quick announcements as we begin. To help us with attendance, please enter your name, email and affiliation into the chat, which can be accessed by clicking on the speech bubble icon on the navigation bar at the bottom of your window. If you're one of our BeWell Texas providers, please make sure that you identify yourselves during this session. If you're joining by phone, please email your phone number and name to bwelltx at yuthiska.edu. Some housekeeping, please stay muted unless you're speaking. If you've joined by computer, your mute button is on the bottom left of your Zoom controls. If you're on the phone, just press star six. We encourage everyone to speak, especially during the discussion portion of this session. We want to hear from as many of you as possible, so please keep your comments brief to allow time for others to speak up. You could also use the chat feature to share your comments and questions. Please note that no protected health information is allowed in either the chat or the discussions. If you would like to view closed captioning, you can uh, uh, select the uh, show captions option. Towards the end of the session, the BVL Texas team will send out an, a link to an evaluation survey. All participants filling out the survey will be automatically entered into a raffle for a $30 Walmart gift card. Our didactic today is on pharmacology of stimulant use disorders and will be presented by Dr. Ad Adrian de la Cruz. Following that, we will be discussing a case presented by Cherise Ramire. We will start with introductions followed by didactics. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, BWL program announcements, case presentation, and open discussion. Thank you all for joining in today's ECHO. We look forward to learning alongside all of you and encourage you all to share your experiences, questions, and insights in today's conversation. And with that, we will do some introductions. Uh, Dr. Kowalczuk. Hi, I'm Alicia, Dr. Kowalczuk. I'm an associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine and medical director with um, Santa Maria Hostel. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Dr. Waklu. Hi, Siddharth Waklu, I'm professor of psychiatry at UD Southwestern and uh, uh, the director of the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. De La Cruz. Hi, everyone. I'm Adrienne De La Cruz. I am an addiction psychiatrist assistant professor, professor at UT Southwestern. I'm one of the associate directors of our psychiatry residency. Thank you so much for joining us today. Cherise. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cherise Ramirez. I'm the nursing program manager for our office-based addiction treatment program at Harris Health. Thank you so much for joining us today. Andrea Hebler. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Hebler, and I am one of the leaders at CSAT. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. And with that, we will move on to our didactics. Um, Dr. De La Cruz, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Okay, great. Now let me just pull up my slides and we'll get started. Um, and I included a case presentation in my talk. I know that um, there'll be another one later. So, all right, uh, we're gonna do a quick overview of uh, pharmacotherapy for the treatment of stimulant use disorders. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, learning objectives for the session are for everyone to be able to describe two different evidence-based strategies for the management of stimulant use disorders. Um, to think about the evidence that supports and does not support the idea of agonist therapy for stimulant use disorders. Um, and we will we'll see if we get to uh, areas for future research. It's sort of implied. All right. So this is the reminder that um, stimulants are a, a significant health problem in the United States. Um, so the data that you're looking at are mortality data um, from the years 2000 to 2015. 
um, divided by race slash ethnicity and uh, sex. So you have uh, men on the left-hand side, women on the right, NHB, this top row is non-Hispanic black, middle row is Hispanic, and bottom row is non-Hispanic white. Um, and what you can see is uh, the bars are showing mortality rates. So the mortality rates associated with cocaine use in non-Hispanic black men approximately equal the mortality rates associated uh, with opioid use in non-Hispanic white men. Um, while the rates of uh, death among Hispanic men are about equal um, between cocaine and heroin. Um, so remember, stimulants are also deadly. This thing down here with opiates killing white men got called an epidemic. This thing here with cocaine killing black men didn't get called an epidemic. So it's important to keep those uh, factors in mind as well. So when we talk about stimulant use disorder, we're mostly talking about cocaine, methamphetamine, amphetamine, and all of their derivatives. So some of these are prescription medications. Some of these are um, exclusively illicit substances. Um, these stimulants share a common mechanism of action in that they um, block the reuptake of the monoamines, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin at the synapse. And then amphetamines also cause efflux of the monoamines um, out of the reuptake transporter, so they reverse its action. Um, all stimulants present with this very similar intoxication pattern in which patients who are acutely intoxicated are euphoric, they have increased energy, decreased appetite, uh, decreased sleep, decreased need for sleep, as well as impulsivity. Um, and you can often see symptoms of psychosis, uh, particularly with methamphetamine in people who are intoxicated. Um, the withdrawal syndrome tends to be mostly hypersomnia and depression. And um, we often see these patients in the emergency department or when they are first um, enter residential treatment. These are patients who are just profoundly asleep. I um, mean, there's really no waking them up for a day or two until they've moved through this withdrawal period. Um, important to remember that stimulant withdrawal is not life-threatening, although patients as part of that profound depression can sometimes develop suicidal ideation. Um, and th that's an important factor to keep in mind when you're thinking about the risk to the patients. Um, the diagnosis of stimulant use disorder follows the exact same pattern as all of the other um, use disorders um, in, defined in the DSM, um, where the major focus is on a maladaptive pattern of use. Okay, this is, uh, I happen to have a new patient in my clinic last week who is a really nice example of a classic stimulant use disorder. So I uh, added him into this talk. Um, this was a 55 year old man who came to see me for initial evaluation with his wife on referral from his primary care doctor. Um, the patient's chief complaint was that he has depression, anxiety, and what he described as a dual addiction to crack and cocaine. Um, he's been using crack slash cocaine intermittently for the last 30 years and actively working on his sobriety for the past six. He uses one to three times per week and spends $85 to $150 per use. Um, in terms of his treatment history, he did he's done two different 30-day residential treatment programs in the last two years. Um, and also had one time when he was in an intensive outpatient program, but found it difficult to maintain his sobriety while he was in IOP. Um, and, and his estimate for his longest period of sobriety was about 60 days that included a 30 days of being in residential and then the 30 days after that. Um, regarding his mood symptoms, he talked a lot about mood swings. He typically starts the day in a good mood. Um, but can easily find that he's extremely irritable um, or at least verbally aggressive. Sometimes that becomes physically aggressive. Um, he also says that his brain is constantly on the go and he really prefers to be multitasking and, and just doing stuff all of the time. Um, on my exam, I, he spoke rapidly and he was a little bit difficult to interrupt, um, but the patient and his wife agreed that the way that I saw him is what he is like all of the time. His speech doesn't get faster. 
Um, and he doesn't have distinct periods where his mood is different, but he just has these daily mood swings. Um, the mood swings were less pronounced, but still somewhat present during that 60 days of sobriety. Um, and his wife agreed that they are more pronounced. The mood swings happen more and are more noticeable um, during periods that he's using cocaine more. Um, he, the medications he was on at the beginning of our visit were the medicines he was discharged from residential treatment on. Um, Buspirone, escitalopram, naltrexone, and oxcarbazepine. Um, but he noted that he wasn't currently taking the naltrexone because they told him in residential treatment he should only take it if it's been at least 10 days since his last uh, use of illicit drugs. And he hasn't been able to go more than about seven days without using, so he hasn't been taking the naltrexone. Um, so uh, to sort of get us started, um, we want to think about what would be the evidence-based treatment recommendations for a patient like this uh, with a stimulant use disorder. Okay, so on the um, non-pharmacotherapy side, um, there are two types of therapy with a pretty good evidence base. Um, one is contingency management and the other is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, contingency management is also known as voucher-based reinforcement therapy. And this is where um, patients earn a reinforcer based on maintaining of their sobriety. Um, it's got an extremely strong evidence base, uh, particularly for helping patients with stimulant use disorders um, gain sobriety. Um, we don't see it used very much outside of research studies because uh, it's hard to get payers to uh, pay for contingency management even though it's actually extremely inexpensive and can be done without a lot of money. Um, and then the other um, evidence-based um, intervention for relapse prevention in patients with stimulant use disorders is cognitive behavioral therapy um, de delivered it either as an individual or a group in a group setting. Um, and that's often got a relapse prevention mode to it. Um, so those are the evidence-based psychotherapy interventions. So then when we think about pharmacotherapy, and there are no medications with an FDA indication specifically for the treatment of stimulant use disorder, um, but then there's a whole bunch of stuff that we use. And um, so for patients specifically with methamphetamine use disorder, we think about naltrexone with or without bupropion and bupropion with or without naltrexone. Um, mirtazapine, we think about agonist approaches. And then for cocaine use disorder, we think about those agonist approaches as well as to pyramate. Um, I think there's a lot of debate in the literature about whether the treatment of methamphetamine use disorder is different from the treatment of cocaine use disorder or whether they can all be grouped together as stimulant use disorder. Um, but you'll see in individual literature studies, they tend to talk about a medication as either being as they're test, ass assessing its efficacy in the treatment of either methamphetamine use disorder or um, in the treatment of cocaine use disorder. Okay, so um, the history of pharmacotherapy for stimulant use disorders is that many, many, many medicines have been shown not to be effective. Um, these include typical antipsychotics, atypical antipsychotics, um, antidepressants, including SSRIs and tricyclics, um, a variety of anticonvulsants and muscle relaxers, uh, treatments for other uh, substance use disorders, including a camprosate, varenicline, and methadone, and then cognitive enhancers, including memantine and atomoxetine. Almost all clinical trials of student use disorders are limited by the fact um, that um, this is really hard work to get done, and that many patients with stimulant use disorders um, show very low medication adherence in clinical trials or are lost to follow up even in the context of a clinical trial. So it's a little bit hard to say doesn't work versus not really fully well tested. All right, this is from, and um, there's a couple of really excellent review articles. I've got the full references at the end. This is a summary of what's known of, as of 2019 about what was known as the treatment of methamphetamine use disorder. Um, gray here is show that this is a medication that was no different than placebo. 
Um, green is this medication showed that it was better than placebo. Um, and you can see there's two there, methylphenidate and topiramate. Um, but since then, we've had a couple of clinical trials um, that have had some really promising evidence. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about is a study looking at the efficacy of bupropion and naltrexone in methamphetamine use disorder. <clears throat> and I'll say this is a clinical trial that I worked on. Um, this study looked at the um, combination of using extended release um, uh, naltrexone, that's the Vivitrol formulation, as well as extended release bupropion, which is oral. Um, the study recruited 403 adults with methamphetamine use disorder who had used methamphetamine at least 18 out of the 30 days before study enrollment and had a urine drug screen positive for methamphetamine at the time of study start. So they were actively using when they entered the clinical trial. Um, and the, the primary outcome of the study was people were considered to have responded to the medication if three of their four urine drug screens were negative for methamphetamine during a two-week evaluation period. Um, this trial gets confusing quickly because there's a bunch of stuff about different stages and what happened in the different stages. But here is your take home message is that the study participants who uh, received the medication, the combination of bupropion and naltrexone, um, were, ha were more likely to be responders, were more likely to show three or four urine drug screens negative for methamphetamine um, in the two week period in which they were evaluated. And um, so in stage one, the the medication response rate was about 17% compared to about 3% among placebo. Um, in stage uh, two, it was 11% among, among uh, medication res responders compared to 2% of placebo responders. Um, that Another way to think about this is number needed to treat, which is how many people would you have to take medicine to see them, to have a good, to see somebody be respond. And for this study, that was nine. That's really similar to other psychiatric medications. Um, one of the other ways to look at these data is the um, percent of urine drug screens that were negative uh, for methamphetamine. Um, so uh, in these studies, the combination of naltrexone and bupropion is shown in the colored solid line, and the placebo is shown in the dotted line. Um, very few people are have negative urine drug screens for methamphetamine at the beginning of the trial. And then you can see that the medication group quickly separates and you're getting between 20 and 25% urine drug screens negative for methamphetamine in the treatment group compared to between five and 10% in the placebo group. Um, one of the other studies that has come out since then looked at the effect of mirtazapine for patients with methamphetamine use disorder. Um, and this study specifically uh, looked at men who have sex with men. Men was really broadly defined as either cisgender men or transgender uh, women who identify as men. Um, and they looked at the efficacy of 30 milligrams of mirtazapine given daily to reduce methamphetamine use. They had 120 uh, participants in the study um, and they looked at the urine drug screens at week after 12, 24, and 36 weeks of treatment. Um, this is, we're now looking at the uh, number of people who had a urine drug screen positive for methamphetamine, so the opposite of what we just looked at. So uh, urine drug screen uh, plus methamphetamine being lower is a treatment response. So you can see that it uh, 12 weeks, um, the fewer people in the mirtazapine group had a urine drug screen that was positive for methamphetamine than in the placebo group. Um, and that was also true at weeks 24 and 36. Um, and here you can see, uh, this is again, urine drug screens positive for methamphetamine. So lower is better. Um, the blue line is the placebo. The orange line is uh, treatment with mirtazapine. And you can see that after a couple of weeks, the orange line, those treated with mirtazapine, had lower rates of urine drug screens positive for methamphetamine than people receiving placebo. So 
Um, now we're going to move on to talk about the idea of agonist therapy. And um, the the concept of agonist therapy is that instead of having, the, is that you use a treatment medication that has a very similar pharmacology to the abused drug, um, and you're replacing the abused drug with a safe scheduled medication with the goal of reducing craving and relapse. So the agonist substitution therapies that we know and love for opioid use disorder, we have methadone and buprenorphine. For nicotine use disorder, we have renaclean and nicotine replacement therapy. And so the equivalent medications for patients with stimulant use disorders would be amphetamine derivatives, methylphenidate, or modafinil. Um, and so in um, cocaine use disorder, there is some evidence that agonist these agonist approaches can work. For example, dextroamphetamine at a dose of 60 milligrams daily can decrease cocaine use in adults. Um, similarly, mixed amphetamine salts at a dose of 80 milligrams daily um, was shown to decrease cocaine use in adults who had cocaine use disorder and ADHD. Um, you see similar results if you use prescription methamphetamine as the treatment medication that can decrease cocaine use. Um, and there's some evidence that modafinil at 400 milligrams daily can also decrease cocaine use. In all of these studies, pretty much all of these studies tested lower doses of these medications and the lower doses were not effective. So we know you've got to be at a pretty high dose range for these agonist um, approaches to work. Um, and as I noted earlier, you've got, you had low medication adherence and low study re treatment retention in these studies. So there's a very small number of people who took the medicine and that that's part of what these data are based on. We don't have a good sense of, well, how does this work for a large group of people? Um, a systematic review looking overall at the um, evidence for using this kind of approach for, for using a prescription stimulant as a treatment for cocaine use disorder found a small benefit. Um, it's not super strong evidence, but there's something there. Uh, so far, it looks like there's something there. All right. Uh, okay. So then one of the other medications that you hear about a lot, particularly in the treatment of cocaine use disorder, is topiramate. Um, topiramate at 200 milligrams daily has been shown to decrease cocaine use um, and can increase rates of abstinence at 200 or 300 milligrams daily. And um, these effects are not consistently found in all studies. Um, uh, the dose of 300 milligrams daily did not affect cocaine use in patients who had comorbid cocaine use disorder and opioid use disorder. Um, and it's also important to remember that when you're using topiramate, you have all of the topiramate side effects. I and mean, then the one that patients really notice the most is the cognitive dulling um, that's associated with topiramate treatment. So this is. Um, a review article that it summarizes um, cocaine pharmacotherapy treatment. Um, so uh, this is a place where green, again, means this is a medicine that uh, seems to have some efficacy. Red is, uh, it did worse than placebo, so you should not use it. Um, and so you can see, um, so bupropion, the psychostimulants, um, and topiramate are the ones that look like they uh, increase abstinence and decrease drug use. Okay, so going back to my patient, um, you'll remember he was discharged from residential treatment and came to see me on buspirone, escitalopram, naltrexone, which he was not taking, and oxcarbazepine. Um, we decide, and I'm a big fan of only make of trying to only make one change per visit so that if the patient changes clinically, we know what happened. Um, we agreed that the buspro and the escitalopram were fine. They may not be helping anything. They're not hurting anything. So we just let them be. I told him it was okay to start taking the naltrexone. 
Um, so the thing about don't take the naltrexone was because when he was in residential treatment and they did urine drug screens, his urine tested positive for fentanyl, um, right? He's a stimulant user. He's not an opioid user. Our, the Everyone's assumption is that this is because there's so much fentanyl in the drug supply that there were trace amounts of fentanyl in um, the cocaine that he was using and that that's likely to be true, but there is no evidence that he is physiologically dependent on opioids. He's never had opioid withdrawal and he's not using daily. Um, so I've told him, I think it is safe for him to take the naltrexone. Um, we, we the, the kind of two sets of uh, treatment that I thought about with him were to pyramate versus treating with a psychostimulant. Um, and I think some of that um, multitasking and fast talking and difficult to interrupt, I think he likely has undiagnosed ADHD. Um, and I sort of wondered about would a psychostimulant be beneficial um, in, in trying to address comorbid ADHD? Um, but I was worried the thing that really limits me personally in using the psychostimulants is knowing that you really need high doses of the medicines to be effective. And I thought starting with topiramate would be safer um, and that we the slowing down might be beneficial to him. Um, so we're going to increase it slowly and see how he tolerates it. Um, and then just a note on oxcarbazepine, and this is a thing I get really fired up about as a psychiatrist who likes evidence-based practice. Um, there is no psychiatric indication for oxcarbazepine. It is not an effective mood stabilizer. This patient does not have bipolar disorder and he does not need to be on oxcarbazepine. Um, so we're gonna work on getting rid of the medicine that I don't think is doing anything for him. Um, and so that I've got that question mark about, is there a future role for stimulant treatment for this patient? Are we ultimately gonna go the stimulant route? How's he gonna do on the tapirmate? I don't know yet. Okay, uh, here are the references. And the review articles by Campman and the two by Chan are extremely helpful overviews of the treatment of stimulant use disorders. Highly recommend those three papers. And then the two studies that I talked about specifically with methamphetamine treatment are the Trivedi paper and the Coffin paper. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. De La Cruz. This was a wonderful presentation, a great overview today. I'll open up the floor uh, for some questions or comments from our learning community here. Yes. Um, Richard. Oh, yes. Hi. Yeah, that was a great uh, presentation. Thank you. So there are um, at federal and state levels, no, no uh, barriers to if somebody did use stimulant, did use an agonist in treatment, as far as you know, that's permitted. As far as I know, yes. Uh, obviously, particularly if the patient also has comorbid ADHD, and we right, we know there's a, a high comorbidity between substance use disorders and ADHD and between stimulant use disorders and ADHD. Um, the, uh, I, Dr. Wapley was here with me and hopefully will keep me on track. The federal prohibitions around opioids are specific to opioids about... Uh, you can you, right. You can't treat opioid use disorder with morphine. That's a violation of federal law. That is specific to opioids. It does not carry over to stimulants. Thank Dr. Andrews, uh, Dr. De La Cruz, uh, the, the first uh, outstanding presentation. This is lovely. This is a very good overview. But Dr. Andrews, to your question, you're better off uh, treating with non-stimulant medications, where where whereas Dr. De La Cruz showed the evidence is better than using stimulants. The, the, my clinical experience with using stimulants for uh, stimul uh, using prescribed stimulants for other cocaine or met methamphetamine use disorders has been, uh, my experience has been dismal. I mean, I've really been disappointed. It's, uh, uh, it just doesn't help. You're, you're much better off using uh, the combination of uh, Wellbutrin plus naltrexone 
I have even at times added mitrazapine, uh, done the ADAPT combination like that Dr. Dalla Cruz talked about, and then added uh, mitrazapine for augmentation to help these patients. So that, that's my take on it. I'm not a big fan of using stimulants because they really don't work, if you ask me. And Dr. Dalla Cruz clearly showed the evidence is weak. No, the, yeah, that point is well taken. I, I have no intention of running right out and prescribing uh, uh, agonists, uh, but- uh, No, I, I, didn't mean, I, I, I didn't mean you're going to do that, but I just thought I just sh share my, my experience with you. I, no, no, I that's, that, that's helpful. I, but I always like to know with, in, with any drug, I like to know what the legal landscape is uh, so that I even know what's potentially in the in the in the armamentarium, you know, I mean, I, you know, that that's important. So thank you. Um, I see a comment here in the chat. Um, uh, it's a Neville, did you want could you summarize it, please, if you're able to? <laughs> you're muted. Yeah, there you go. I, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll read it out then. Um, assuming that stimulant users produce lower amounts of dopamine than others and appear to seek to normalize these levels with stimulants, why do not give people stimulant use disorder lower, lower level of stimulants like Adderall, Ritalin, et cetera? Um, we, do you want me to just take it from from there? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. You can take so, it. Yeah. So I so let me say that I think there are. If you read the literature on this, the literature reads like the researchers desperately want the strategy to work. Um, it it theoretically it should work, but we've had a really hard time getting it to work. Right. The history of the clinical trials is it doesn't work that well. Um, I, I am in fully in favor of treating ADHD with stimulants, um, including in patients with substance use disorders, and even sometimes in patients with stimulant use disorders. I, I have patients with a history of cocaine use disorder to whom I prescribe stimulants for treatment of their ADHD, and it has gone well, right? It's very, very careful in the beginning. And then as you know that the patients are maintaining sobriety, are living their life, are doing well, I treat those patients like everybody else. Um, I'd also take issue, although I will take issue with the beginning of this statement, we, we don't know that stimulant users produce lower amounts of dopamine. I think that's, um, I think the evidence would be more about what their dopamine receptors look like um, and how long those differences persist. Um, is that a direct effect of many years of stimulant use versus is that a baseline difference in the expression of dopamine receptors? I don't know that we know yet. Thank you so much. And thank you for the question. All right, with that, we will move on to the next part of our session today. Thank you again, Dr. De La Cruz. It was a wonderful uh, presentation and discussion. And we will move on to some announcements. The Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring provides high quality education to health care providers. CSTAT makes evidence-based practices available to addiction specialists in Texas and the U.S. with sessions like the one you're attending today. For more information, please visit bewelltexas.org. Next slide. To claim your CME credits, you must text by midnight tonight. Text attend 1009-3844 to the number on the screen to record your attendance. Next slide. Please join us for our next T TextRx Echo. It will be on Tuesday, August 15th. We have a great uh, session lined up. Thank you so much. And now we will, we will move on to our case uh, presentation. Um, thank you so much, Cato, for bringing the case up. And uh, Sharice, you can take it away. Uh, can you guys hear me? Because I'm having some in and out going on on, on my end. We hear you perfectly fine. Thank you. 
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those who came a little later, I'm Sharice Ramirez, the program manager for the Office Based Addiction Treatment Program here at Harris Health, specifically at our Acres Home Health Center. Today, I wanna to present to you a 44 year old um, African American female who has been in our program um, almost a year now. She started with us um, in August of 2022. And hopefully um, you guys can give me some insight into her. Um, um, if you can scroll down, I guess the questions that I wanna ask, I know that she's a prime candidate for injectable buprenorphine. And so we're trying to work with our leaders and organization to try to get the injectables because we have so many patients that this would help. And, and so I wanna present this to you today. So if, if you guys can help us with this. So her substance use history, her primary problem that we found out when she came to us was fentanyl. She came to us saying that um, her drug of choice was Percocet, but initially her urine um, drug toxicology results have always come back negative for opiates and positive fentanyl. She's never been positive for any other substances, no cocaine, no benzos or marijuana. Um, when she came to us, um, what happened, she, unintentionally overdosed because she thought she was taking Percocet and she was referred to us through the HEROES program. So she had never had any substance use counseling in the past. She is getting that counseling with our um, own office-based addiction treatment behavioral therapist now. She's never had any inpatient substance use treatment. Um, she's not a part of any 12-step um, support groups. She has been on buprenorphine with us, although in the past six months, she's not been adhering to our program. And she's never been on methadone or naltrexone. Her PMPs, every time we've checked them, there's been no discrepancies. Um, the mental status um, from our behavioral therapist and our psychiatry here at Harris Health, she's been diagnosed with major depressive disorder and complex post-traumatic stress disorder as um, severe trauma with child and adult. Um, DSM-5 criteria, this was answered by my behavioral therapist and all of those were yes, except her tolerance, but I need to make a correction to that because she um, she's in clinic today. Um, yay, because I haven't been able to get in touch with her and she has reported that she has increased her use of her oral fentanyl today. She was honest with me today. Um, relevant medications that she's on, um, when she's taking her buprenorphine, she's on eight milligrams TID. She's actually um, on metoprolol and lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide combo for her primary hypertension. She is on lamepiride for her diabetes. She was prescribed um, fluoxetine and hydroxyzine from psychiatry, but she's not um, adherent to that therapy, and she's also on gabapentin. So medical comorbidities, type no. two diabetic, primary hypertension. Um, she does have some coronary artery disease and she has a history of diverticulosis. Our proposed treatment plan for her, I needed her to go to inpatient detox. She, she, she is consistently using fentanyl. Um, she has put herself into precipitative withdrawals before because we've given her her buprenorphine and she went home and took it and she wasn't honest with us and put herself into precipitative withdrawals. Um, again, we feel and um, she's an optimal candidate for buprenorphine injection just to protect her because we know that she's using fentanyl daily. Our past treatment plan, um, we were giving her buprenorphine eight milligrams um, three times a day to protect her. We had her coming in with weekly visits and all of her urine drug screens were positive for fentanyl. Um, in our program, we also check for buprenorphine and norbuprenorphine. And when she was compliant with the program, her levels were good. So we knew that she was taking her medicines. Um, when she began to miss her appointments um, and she would come in sporadically, we would have her keep her wrappers and we would do counts and she was bringing her wrapper counts in. And so we knew that she wasn't using her or diverting her buprenorphine. For her diabetes, because her um, diabetes is uncontrolled and her A1C, her last A1C was eight. And so we got her diabetes education she reported to me that she kept using the fentanyl because she was having um, 
dental issues. So we got her an urgent dental appointment and we got her to cardiology because she admitted to me one time that she was having um, chest pain and chest pain on exertion and at risk. So she ended up having a heart catheterization that confirmed she does have some coronary artery disease. And then our final, um, our final, um, what we were trying to get her in, we were bringing her in every three days and giving her in-clinic dosings of her Suboxone because we wanted to protect her from overdose. And right now, that's where we are. I'm happy to say I was actually able to get in touch with her on yesterday, and she is in clinic today. I was able to get in touch with a inpatient detox at um, Dr. Kowalczyk Santa Maria, and she has agreed to go over there. And so hopefully she's going to be going tomorrow. So I'm, I'm excited about that. But we, I want to talk about injectable buprenorphine and how we can get this in our organization, or if there's somewhere that somewhere's out there that they have it already that we can refer her to. Cherise, thank you for the presentation. Can I ask some, uh, just some clarification? So this patient, can you hear me well? Uh, Cherise, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. No, I was wondering whether Cherise could hear me or not, because she seemed to, okay, okay. So uh, Cherise, my, my question is, does this is this patient compliant with buprenorphine dosing on a daily? I mean, she comes to clinic every three days, so she takes that the day she comes in. What about the other two days? Right now, Dr. Um, Waklu, she has not been compliant with her buprenorphine. She has not had it in a month. She admitted to me today that she hasn't had it in a month. She's not had it in a month. So, no. uh, and any periods of time when she has actually taken buprenorphine consistently? Say it again, it's kind of going, my internet, my connection is going in and out for some reason. Any period of time that she has taken buprenorphine consistently? Prior to about four months ago, she was coming weekly and she was consistent with her buprenorphine. Um, I think her tolerance um, increased and when her tolerance increased, she was not coming to her appointments weekly. So we would see her every two weeks, once a month, um, she struggles as a single parent, so sometimes her phone was off and things like that. So, okay. Now, the, my other question is: when she takes buprenorphine, when she takes suboxone consistently, is she still positive for fentanyl, or is it only when she misses doses? My last visit with her, I think the question was: is she still positive for fentanyl? Even when she's taking buprenorphine, was she? Still positive for fentanyl when she was taking buprenorphine consistently. Yes. So, uh, so the the question is, uh, does buprenorphine work for her opioid use disorder? Is is the is the is this the right medication? Because I have some you know, Cherries, I have some patients, and Dr. Dela Cruz uh, can share also. She has some. Is that some of my patients will say, Dr. Bakhtu, it just doesn't do it. It just doesn't cut it for me. Mm -hmm. uh, suboxone doesn't suppress my cravings. Uh, I have them on 24 milligrams. It said they, it just doesn't do it. So the, the, uh, so the question starting off is, is buprenorphine the appropriate opiate agonist treatment for this patient? Or should she be sent to a, 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 a opiate treatment program to get methadone maintenance? So, so those are, that, that would be my, is this the right medication for her? Or uh, yeah, that that that. So I mean, I know your your question was about sublocate and injectable mm -hmm. buprenorphine. I think the first question we need to determine is is buprenorphine the appropriate medication for this patient. I, I guess we always um, go for the buprenorphine because that's going to be easiest for her. But um, you may be actually right. I'm just thinking if 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 she's not compliant weekly how would she be compliant daily going to a methadone or something like that? Uh, no, I know you do, you do have a good point there, though um, methadone regulations, I'm not sure how things are, in, uh, how, uh, but methadone regulations at the federal level have eased quite a bit. If you, this, the recent SAMHSA guidelines on methadone have really become very liberal. 
I'm not sure, and Dr. Kowalchal, please uh, educate me. I, I tried to ask some methadone and clinic medical directors and they didn't have an answer for me. I'm not sure whether Texas signed up for that uh, for that increased takeout level. I mean, you can get pretty, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I was gonna say, um, I think Dr. Andrews might be able to speak to that, at least what goes on in the local Houston area. Oh, oh thank helpful you. For this, Andrews, end up yeah, helpful please. for this patient. Um, I was writing something down. So uh, can you, uh, I'm like a student in high school. Can you repeat the question? No worries. No worries, Dr. Andrews. So the question is in Texas, um, you know, I know at the federal level um, from the pandemic, and then it's been extended, um, there's kind of some relaxed take home. What's the current practice in the Houston area? Because it sounds like this, this person may need full agonist. Um, and uh, but struggles with adherence to even weekly clinic visits for her buprenorphine. Um, so we were just wanting to know kind of what's the status uh, in Texas of take home sure. with you. Yeah, yeah, I can. I comment. mean, not bup, uh, methadone. methadone. I can comment on that. Uh, there's really a wider variation, uh, you know, because there's, you might say three different levels of, uh, of policy or protocols one is what the feds require you to do or not do. The other one is what the state requires you to do or not do. And the other one is what the uh, owner, usually private uh, of the methadone clinic wants you to do or not do. And, and um, generally, since I'm not the owner of the clinic, I generally have to go along with all three levels of regulation, you might say. And so even though during the pandemic, yes, even in Texas, we did have the flexibility and briefly use that. I work at three different methadone clinics, and so they're all different. But um, you know, you know, clinic owners tend to be kind of conservative, uh, and um, so for for a little while, for example, um, for a little while there was some flexibility during the pandemic, but then that flexibility didn't last very long, and has basically. Uh, at all three clinics, uh, you know, well, at one clinic, I only do buprenorphine. I don't do methadone, even though it is a methadone clinic, but somebody else does the methadone. But I, I think at all three clinics, they, they tend to not uh, take advantage of the flexibilities, even when they are available. I just became the medical director of one of the clinics. And so I'm going to, I think, have a little more influence over uh, appropriate increased flexibility um, we'll see how that goes, but I think I will. I'm confident. And um, and then for I was going to say for you know you, you mentioned um, that uh, the patient it might be inconvenient or whatever Sharice for the patient to go to a methadone clinic, and of course it is inconvenient because they have to go every day initially. But some patients, especially patients with a lot of chaos in their lives and who have not done well with less monitored situations. Some patients, even though it's a pain in the neck to go to the clinic every day, there are some patients who actually appreciate it and actually seek that initially be precisely because they are, if they can get the transportation worked out and other things like daycare and so on, uh, they, they actually like the fact that they're being held accountable because they have to go there every day, well, six days a week. Um, and uh, so that's something to consider. And, and of course, we can treat anybody without regard, because of the state funding, we can treat anybody completely free. Uh, and so insurance status or anything, none of that matters uh, because of the state funding. I think the other thing to remember for adherence for this patient in terms of clinic visits is if, if someone's taking a medication that's not quite effective for them, there's less incentive to be adherent, I think, than if they get on a medication that they really feel is working well for them. Sometimes that helps them, you know, kind of figure out and be willing to put in kind of some, some extra effort to figure out, you know, how to get there. Although it does still, I'm not mitigating the barriers. Um, and especially with, um, you know, her having a five-year-old and very little family support, um, you know, we can, we will definitely, if, she, you know, she comes in tomorrow to Santa Maria, we'll uh, definitely address all of that with her. Um, you know, we wouldn't really recommend detoxing her, just, you know, um, kind of re hopefully restabilizing her and maybe offering to get her to methadone, offering to get her a little more intensive level of um, behavioral support. 
um, linking her to a peer, um, you know, recovery coach who might be able to help her um, more consistently navigate adherence to appointments and any, anything she chooses to do ongoing for her recovery. Um, so that might be helpful for her. Um, and our facility does accept um, children um, to be in treatment with her if she's looking for a residential stay. Although we know the mainstay of this is gonna be getting her on appropriate medication therapy and figuring out what works for her. I was going to say also regarding, uh, you know, uh, every clinic, again, has different policies, but, and some clinics don't allow people to bring their kids, but, but Texas Clinic Fulton, um, which has the state funding available that, they, uh, you know, pa patients come in with their kids all the time, and they're quite welcome there. So that should not be an issue, that, that one factor. Oh, well, that's good to know. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments on today's uh, case? Sharice, did you have any other questions for our um, hub team here? Not at the moment. I have a I have a general question if I can throw it out there. Mm -hmm. uh, of course. I, I've already spoken too much, but if since nobody else uh, said anything. <laughs> so, um, I've, I've been quite interested since I'm in a methadone clinic. Uh, we, we commonly have a situation, for example, where a patient uh, asks about transitioning to buprenorphine um, uh, or where I even advise them to move to buprenorphine, because as was said earlier, buprenorphine doesn't work for everybody, but, but, um, but it does work for uh, quite a few, and methadone works for quite a few, and actually probably most people would do okay on either one, but, uh, but some patients have contraindications to being on methadone um, or too many side effects, things like that, and so uh, I... Uh, nobody's really figured out a, a, a great way to transition from either street opioids or, or methadone. In, in my case, it's even more commonly the case that, that they're on methadone and I wanna transition them. But I, I heard about uh, a technique being used by some, uh, some methadone providers, and that is where they have the patient swallow the first few doses of sublingual sublingu sublingu bup. Uh, which normally we wouldn't do because you'd get, you know, less, less effective buprenorphine dose. But of course, when you're trying to do microdosing of buprenorphine in order to not precipitate uh, withdrawal, then, uh, you know, getting less than the usual dose is exactly what you're looking for. And so I wonder if anybody here has, has heard about that or, or what they think about the idea of deliberately having them swallow the first three days worth of sublingual doses uh, while transitioning to, uh, to buprenorphine. Any, any thoughts on that? Not swallowing, just doing micro induction, but not swallowing well. Yeah, I think the concern for swallowing is we really don't know what dose the individual is gonna be actually receiving um, it isn't, hasn't been studied to my knowledge, um, but there are microdosing protocols out there. I'm aware of the ones for fentanyl. I'm not aware of the ones, um, you know, what work's been done with the methadone to suboxone or buprenorphine transition. Um, the, the methadone, I guess the methadone clinic situation is a little different because we can't really do microdosing because then the clinic owners, uh, you know, the lowest dose we have is two milligrams for buprenorphine, right? And so uh, the clinic owners, you know, because they have to deal with the state and the feds in terms of audits and, uh, you know, what do you mean you cut it in half? Where's the other half? And, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so it's not easy in a methadone clinic to achieve less than a two milligram dose. That's the problem. 
And so I'm trying to make it uh, a solution, you know, since we know with, you know, high first pass metabolism that, you know, it's thought that what any, I mean, I see, I know the numbers vary, but anywhere from what 10% to maybe 15 or 20% of the, of the bup actually, you know, uh, would be effective when swallowed. And in a methadone clinic, we, we need something that doesn't involve cutting tablets or cutting strips. So, but it's hard to find information on it. It seems logically like it should work, but, and it's only for three days. You're microdosing anyway. You don't, you don't care what the exact dose is as long as it's less than maybe a milligram or whatever, you know, I would say, but. Thank you so much. And uh, this has been a wonderful discussion. And uh, Dr. Waklu, if you could please uh, help us summarize some of the important points for Sherry's today. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Sherry. So we, uh, uh, we had a, uh, an excellent case presentation on a, on a patient who uh, uh, has difficulty with compliance with treatment, but even when compliant, we're not sure whether the sublingual buprenorphine is the, uh, the appropriate agonist therapy for her because her even uh, on times when she's compliant, she continues to, to use illicit opioids uh, uh, on top. And plus, uh, of course, the treatment of choice for a patient like this would be continued uh, maintenance and definitely looking at alternative agonist therapies like methadone. And um, uh, uh, I would not even... I would not even go near uh, ant antagonist therapies like naltrexone for this for this patient. Yeah. So that would be my next step to is is a trial, clearly a trial of methadone maintenance. And Dr. Call should make an excellent point. If she responds well to the men, uh, to the methadone maintenance, she is more likely to be compliant and engage in treatment. Thank you, Thank Shreya. Thank you so much, Dr. Vaklu, and thank you everybody for joining today's session. Um, as a reminder to earn C credits, please text the activity code 1009-3844 uh, to 844-502-1338 by midnight today. We also request you to please complete the post-session uh, feedback survey using the link in the chat. The survey link will be open for one week. If you would like to present a case, please email bewelltx at yudhiska.edu. We look forward to seeing you at our next session, which will be on Tuesday, August 15th. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day and enjoy your summer. Thank you. Bye.